So let's start with the working dock. Uh, just a little review and see what, what we can put on a, on a calendar for um, realistic assessment of what all we can do. Yeah, uh, I would say to attach, <clears throat> to look at the goals and then take a look at here's the proposed schedule, what's what's in there, and see if they all check out. So let's go to the critical path doc and throw these things as they are and let's see if there's any gaps. So critical path, the, the document 2021, click on the October that should be actually <coughs> October 21st let's say click on that one click edit underneath that to get into the dock and we can all edit that so uh, what I do here is typically uh, so click on edit and, sh and so there's the working list right there from the manual and does that all check out? So we've got October 21st, 22nd. Um, then we should be realistic and say, okay, so that's the weekend. And then 25th through the 29th. So it's actually really five weeks if we count next week to, so first of all, there's, that's, uh, we're talking about six weeks. It's more like five weeks at this point. What, what software are you using to make these timelines? That's just Google. That we got Google Slides. That's editable Google Slides here. Uh, just bubbles, just uh, same as we've always been using. And just doing um, all the standard features within slides. So anyone can edit this. This should be slide find and edit. What I do typically is okay. So say we've got whatever we've got I like to what I like to do is visually do like a Gantt chart but do like okay so this is gonna stretch this long where's the you know where's the high T chamber gonna stretch to so the last date here we wanna put um, can put a bunch of stuff in here but at the end we're gonna have December 29 um, so that could help us visually orient ourselves Maybe we could find some widget we can put on the wiki. There's a lot of ways to do this. The the only yeah, if you can find one, the requirements are editable, live, collaborable, embeddable. So if you can find something better than this, that would be great. Yeah, uh, you can do that. Yeah, there's. Um, <clears throat> As long as you can do things like hyperlinks here, you can do links to different docs. Uh, you can format it like as you like. The thing that I find about these is that um, <clears throat> basically as soon as you make up the plan and, and you start doing it, you find that the plan changes. That's just agile development. So what's useful about this or any anything that we would do is the live editability part where as soon as something changes, don't necessarily <laughs> erase the page that we started with like you see like I got this history of all this stuff all kinds of plans from all, t all times like for example this is building on what we already talked about October 5th that's uh, that's like page 4 I just took some of those things and put it back put it into October 21 so it's visible and trackable in that sense um, so what's the last date there um, Oh, November. Uh, yeah, it would be more like November. Um, November 30 is Tuesday. Yeah. So we're so according to the working list, let's put those things in. Uh, 
in a page. Uh, I think the question is, is the time right? And does that actually accommodate all the things we got to do? Um, <clears throat> high temperature chamber is not in here, for example. That's one omission that Ken pointed out if we want to do that. So that's one, one thing we want to resolve. Yeah, so we were talking about that earlier this morning. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if, if the goal is, you know, if any of us wants to be able to actually go home and uh, use the type of plastic in our 3D printers, then does it make sense to just do a high temperature chamber for the uh, Pro, the 3D Pro that's down there, or mm -hmm. the universals as opposed to trying to attempt it for the uh, mm -hmm. 3D printer, right? So I think, we, I think we can still do a high temperature chamber, and we can, you know, sort of get the supply chain control for the ecosystem for recycling mm -hmm. plastic, and do it in a way that empowers all of us to be able to do it later, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, so do the one? do the small one. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, do the what? So what do you think about like if you made a high temperature chamber for the D3D Pro that's down there and as part of the printing thing, as opposed to the giant 3D printer? D3D Pro. Uh, you mean the small? Okay. So we can still do a heated chamber. It might not be as aggressive as doing it for the large one, but. None of us have a large screen printer anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So we'd be able to continue on our own to use the size of plastic. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Or do we need like an extra shooter or something? No, no. I mean, uh, the point is that it's all scalable. Everything here that we design is scalable, so you can absolutely do it on a small printer where it would be actually much easier to, to implement it and test. That would be, the, in fact, the proper way to prototype it. You have a smaller scale prototype. You don't get into the like the large structural issues. You use less materials. It's faster, cheaper, uh, quicker to the proof of concept of what we want to do, which is the high temperature chamber. The concept there is the is one, and that is can we keep all the elements out of the heat effectively? Does the shield concept work? Does everything work like we think it should? So that makes a lot of sense. Can we we could start by testing just the shield aspect of just getting a heated enclosure up to temperature? Probably. Yeah. Uh, we can talk about what the the plan would be. So um All right, um, so let's throw it in there. So where where do we want to do that? Um, like in the order, like can we arrange these so they make sense? Is the schedule that we propose here? So um, torch table 25 to the 29. Does that stand? Software, additional topics, software cited of 3D printing. So torch, we're saying, I'm going to throw it here. So Hopefully we've got this window here. Days, right? <laughs> you know. Say it again. So, so hopefully the torch doesn't take another five days. So, you know, the hope is that it doesn't actually take the whole week to, to get that done so that we can do more in that week than we, you know. Also, I think critical path is important now because it's kind of changing. Or it could potentially change. Like if we order blades for the shredder instead of, you know, then we don't need the torch to make the shredder, right? And so that could potentially change how all these come So again, this is just a straw man, you know, to figure out what works best. So I guess my understanding is for the, the heated chamber, it's protecting all of the other parts from being exposed to the high temperature and then it's I've heard that it's needed in order to use recycled plastics but I guess I'm not quite sure why. The need for it is that because uh, plastics tend to warp that when printed they want to be printed at a temperature close to their glass melting glass transition temperature which for PLA is low it's it, you can print in ambient temperature in fact you can print in a freezing 
weather like um, I printed like all the stuff throughout the winter here it's not possible with most plastics and and in fact the ones you hear about like PLA uh, are an exception most plastics delaminate you cannot print with the most common pr plastics ABS polyethylene polypropylene polyethylene is the most common plastic or um, or one of the, the most you can't do it it delaminates completely so take like typical plastics we have here is for recycling not gonna do it anything that's um, so just rare exceptions that you can do it with now the idea is to keep that temperature high so so uh, starting at like for ABS like maybe 60 and going up to like 80 120 for say polycarbonate higher like 150 for extreme temperature things like polyetheramide which is the PEI thing or others so right now like the way I see it it's like PLA TPU um, people talk about PET um, but those two are the ones practical that out of many many that are good for printing without any heat heated chambers so the idea is you can't do anything without a heated chamber like you can s select yourself okay I'm gonna do like PLA and TPU those are just a very tiny fraction of the entire plastic stream so so if you look at uh, Google most common plastics then you say okay can I print them without a chamber and you'll find sorry can't do it so in which sense the state of the 3d printing industry while well, there's a lot of talk about it the reality is that a 3d printing cannot print with plastic if you generalize I mean, you can't print you need a different environment and that's the high temperature environment which is afforded by a high temperature chamber which does not exist so with all the hype it's like you can't do it right now you can't do anything with 3d printing I mean that, that's the fact uh, you know we do some some stuff like PLA PLA is a very specialized plastic it's it's a bioplastic that is one of the thousands of various types of plastics um, but but um, the idea there is that once you tap the waste stream you, you're you're accessing very low cost feedstocks at the cost of a dollar a pound as opposed to a thousand cents per pound you even said we could get lower well one cent is if you if you collect it yourself it's pretty much free if you buy a garbage bell it's like a cent a pound like well, you, you get it you get people to pay to, you can to collect it. you can turn that into a revenue model by actually collecting it so yeah yeah you can you can do that and but all of this not possible without the heated chamber an idea is keep absolutely everything that's temperature sensitive out of out of the, the heat so that means any plastic any electronics what what do electronics last up to they can go up to maybe like 60 C like the the stepper motors they fry above 60 C their lifetime reduces significantly at that point so uh, that's the idea the temperature requirement is is that is for anything practical it's like um, you starting at at like when when the stepper motors begin to break down which is like 60s which would be for ABS like if you google well what do you uh, high, high temperature chamber temperature chamber temperature for ABS what do you get ABS is a very common plastic it's a it's a strong plastic for ABS you get 60 to 70 C so there you're already starting to reduce the lifetime of your motors you and if you have a like your any electronics I mean yes the board can like our ramps board if you have that anywhere near that I mean that al already handles heat if you take it up to 60 from the get-go then it'll probably fail because of the additional heat that it, it gets through just by operating this so in, in terms of heat enclosures uh, yeah. Only really make a point about perhaps doing small ones. Just doable. Yeah. Uh, it's a good idea to create the whole trio of waste plastic management, but to make it even more accessible, like Emmanuel said, I think it's a good idea to focus on smaller 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, so I just copied what what's in what says in here, uh, but there are some gaps definitely for me. It's, so where's the large printer and high temperature chamber? So where do we put that? So that's that's what the doc, the working list doc says right now. Large printer and high T chamber are not not in there. So how do we shift things around? Yeah. So I think we could we could do the. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Is like I'm comfortable with prioritizing. Okay, so do you want to shift the, so since I want to let you guys drive the schedule here, so where do you want to put the high T chamber? So we put it at the end after the filament maker and the shredder, either the right after or, or something in between, so that we finish those two before we attempt the high temperature chamber. We want the success of those two before we do the third one. Okay. <laughs> okay, so can you guys drag that? Where do you see it? So you're saying... I'm hearing filament maker too, too high T. Okay. No, yeah, that's that's perfectly possible if we circumvent the move of blades. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, otherwise, we would need to make an attempt to start for shape C for the So, the, so the, the question I think that we we all have mm -hmm. is: Is there an alternative to making the blades? Is there a blade here? Yeah, we can. There's a cost, and we don't really have a budget. The bud, the type of budget allotted for that was like 500 bucks for the steel if we do our cutting if you're gonna get this cut by somebody I, I would expect it'll probably be like 3,000 bucks or so just to do that um, we can check on a quote but I mean these things ain't cheap once you start getting people to cut a bunch of steel there's a lot of steel there actually quite a bit the blades themselves are gonna be like like 500 pounds by themselves um, for the amount of blades we wanted to put in there um what do you what do you think about like um uh like using like other open source hardware to kind of accelerate that or is it contingency plan? Like for example, I know Open Builds has some open hardware C and C machines. Just what do you think about Yeah, if they provided any of our specs, the first question is to talk about um uh, and, and that gets into the development process, but you'd have to start with a requirement. And what are we after? So if we're after industrial productivity on a small scale, 
it's nothing in an open builds that I've seen that's that I think is relevant at that level. They may may have some some plasma tables that uh, that work, but then you're talking about a completely different infrastructure of doing it. So investing in, in completely new systems which which have their own learning curve. So sure. this would not. But what do you think about open op like using open beams generally? For these machines versus like rods, oh, uh, like open beams and linear rails versus rods. I mean, you can, but the cost factor is about five x. So, I mean, there's cost. Yep. It costs us like I don't know, like five hundred bucks to do the frame we did. Uh, with you wanted to do the the beams there, you might be like five thousand. So there's a definite cost. It gets yeah. really crazy. It's not that much, is it? Oh well, well I think, show I me think the price. It's maybe not five x. It's maybe like two or three x. Uh, yeah, the small scale, the larger scale, it goes exponential. Okay. Take a look at the six. Take a look at what it would. I mean, draw up the. Yeah, do it. Uh, show me the the bill of materials for what it would take to replicate the exact frame we have for the large printer, let's say, or the or the torch yeah. table. I mean, those things are largely hobby. I'm not seeing industrial use coming out of that. Nobody does does aluminum extrusions for industrial that's that's kind of like playing around if you go into industry you got steel um, you can do prototyping and expensive projects at universities with with the, the aluminum stuff but that wouldn't be uh, too highly replicable from our standpoint cost wise and and, and access wise I mean it's a, it's a feedstock that you can't really access in, in many parts of the world steel you pretty much have everywhere I mean especially for designing things around things as simple as rebar which we have so uh, you want to make it universal but the the first question <laughs> the proper build procedure uh, development procedure it's like it's the, there's the requirements there's a development template we should be tracking each each thing according to a development template there's a one line embed code we can do to start any project like for example if you see uh, seed home 2 for example you see this thing this whole thing of all these seeded items those are steps of a formal development process we can seed that with one line for any of the projects like for the CNC torch table I think we've got it um, <laughs> like V2108 that's that's the dev page we started for the torch but we want to keep track of that um, so if you talk about requirements, you got to talk about data collection. So what, where, how are we collecting data? Pictures, how are we uploading pictures or, or recording anything that are the results? So it's more than just here if we talk about global collaboration. <laughs> That's embodied in a development template. Uh, so I put, so I put um, dev template in there. There's timeline, there's goals, like goals. What are we, so what's our definition of done? What, what, are, what are our goals? Like, okay, so say we go... <laughs> talk about the filament maker spooler <coughs> going to high tea chamber so okay so uh <clears throat> just, just so we don't lose track so i think that we're talking about how to reconfigure the schedule and to make things flow in a way that's logical and makes sense mm -hmm. so For, for the shredder, yeah. <clears throat> and so, you know, if we want the full plastic ecosystem, we got to be able to shred it, we got to be able to take the we got to be able to yep. take the heat of the chamber. And right yep. now, the one part of this that's most difficult is making all of the blades for the shredder. So, the question is, the open question is, how can we resolve that? So, one might be to, to descale a little bit. Can we make half of the, <laughs> you know, can we take the shaft lengths and cut them in half? And, we can cut the blades by hand and do very simple blades. You can do it by hand right now. You can cut out a bunch of blades and make a shredder. I mean, even the very simple ones like, um, well, like you saw the precious, did you see the, like the star-shaped precious plastic things? Or just take a regular profile, just trace it and cut it. All you need to do is have, like, once you do the cut, that the angles are at a right angle, so it's actually sharp. And then when they're next to each other, they act like scissors, so you'll be fine. The, what happens actually with a torch is the flame carburizes the steel, so it actually makes it harder. So you can do that readily by, by manual cutting. 
Uh, if we want to do that, that's something we can do today and, and get that shredder up practically we and running. Trace out but it would take more time. Yeah, but practically we would trace, trace out the line of the blade on the yeah. plate, cut it out with a gas torch, and then angle grind it. Um, <coughs> so you take a... You go online and you look at shredder blades, and we've got some. Yeah, you can do that. Print it. Uh, what I would do is uh, maybe cut it out with uh, cut it out with scissors and spray paint it in the pattern, and then like scratch it with a with a sharp nail, and so you can actually see it once the paint starts wearing out. Once you start torching, well, yeah, just torch it by hand, and at the end you just grind the edges. I mean, just grind all that slag down, and you end up with, you know, pretty pretty clean edges, and that's all. And if you make the basic shape, it could be like four teeth per blade. So it's like. Sure, but I'm just really <clears throat> wondering about the fit between that blade and the adjacent blade. Well, they're the blades are flat. They're completely flat when you start. When you when you put the heat to it, it might warp just very slightly. Uh, I don't think it matters too much for the the half inch because it's so thick. But on the torch table, if you're doing like thinner stuff, you put it on the water beds because it will warp like quarter inch and half inch and um, eighth inch will warp a lot. Here you're talking about it still remains very flat. So if you put it on a table, it's sitting pretty flat. And that's what you care. For them to move next to each other smoothly, they only have to be flat. Now, the spacer, so there's blade spacer, right? So we have to cut out the spacers too, uh, which would be a simple like a ring or... I mean, everything has to have that square tube inner profile because we're putting this around the square yeah, shaft. Square. Okay. Yeah, so it's a simple 4x4 four four tube that we're cutting in the middle and then you're cutting out the profile on the outside. Now, <laughs> the spacers, you want to make like, what I would actually do is literally out of paper or like transparency film or even just 3D print, tiny spacers that would be literally like thickness of a few sheets of paper. So you make sure when the blades go against each other, they don't rub. What they do, uh, if you look at precious plastic, what they did is if they have six millimeter blades, they took two three millimeter spacers because once you do that, there's enough inaccuracy between putting two three millimeters together that it is a little bigger than six. So that's what they did. But here we just need a tiny gap. It, it, if you do no gap, it might like because our motors are so strong it probably would not even matter but it would have friction up front until it wears itself out and it, and the blades pretty much mesh tightly against one another because we're really overpowering we've got you know like 18 horsepower of drive that's like way overkill so we, we would still do it with the heavy motors that we have I've yeah. done a picture in the Google presentation on the critical path yeah out some lines here. Yeah. Like what? Uh, Where are you looking at? Page. Yeah. So the gray ones here that are yeah. horizontal, is that the blades? And then you have square shafts coming down. <laughs> You're talking about a picture that we did? No, I'm talking about a picture I'm making right now. Just see the straight one asking. Yeah. Mm. Right. So what I have there is the, the, the two vertical ones is the square shaft. Four inch shaft. Four inch tube around three inch shaft. Yeah. This, is, this the, is this the geometry of the blades? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, they would go like, uh, there would be a, so the geometry would be such that there's a spacer in between every blade, and this, this next blade would come like close to that spacer, like maybe uh, as, as, as much as a quarter inch. So that, you don't have stuff getting stuck in there. You're rubbing against it. That kind of like that. will be a grinding element in itself, wouldn't it? It's... What do you mean by that? Stuff is going to hit up and rub up No, that, the, all that, the entire assembly, like... Okay, so all this stuff here is moving as one piece. Right? Yeah. And when it's rotating against <coughs> the other side that's rotating, mm -hmm. that little gap that just makes we don't get stuff to, to stick that will be effectively like all the grinding surfaces where matter will come through and it will grind to, to both edges. So, so my point is just that maybe it will wear out and create a bigger cavity since the plastic has the same... Uh, over time, yeah, this is... Uh, so I mentioned about the steel hardening with the carburizing flame of the torch. 
they'll harden a little bit. But what you want to do here, actually, I'm talking about space out of steel. Uh, you want to make space out of steel, or I yeah. thought I understood you want to print it. Well, so here's another thing. So what I wanted to print is not what you see there. I wanted to print this, that thing, okay. in red. So, so still a metal part that goes against there, but there'll be a small, tiny space. A tiny there. space that's protected because it's so small. Like you're never gonna really touch it except for the very little edge, which is just a fraction of a millimeter. Yeah. So. And what is the count for you, please? Well, we in the plan we had. Um, 30 inches long, so we had uh, 30 blades on each side. 60 of them. Yeah. yeah, 60 of them. I mean, that's that's for something that really works and has high velocity of throughput. But I mean, you can do it as you know, you can do like a mouth yeah. like this. You can do like you know, that's eight like eight inches, <clears throat> 16 blades. Can you do it? Um, Start small and then you can keep adding. Time. Yeah, I mean we could just start it. You can you can start our big three foot long thing, which I wouldn't cut those shafts. I would just keep them like just just keep adding as many as we can. Start with four and see if you know, or eight uh, over like four inches. You're gonna start cutting stuff. You, stuff falls in there. You start cutting it, and that'll be a a good initial proof of concept. How you go through the full development is oh okay does it work? Maybe we have to change something or maybe. Like we want to add more teeth because for whatever reason or, or close down the spacing or even forget about the gap because it's making things too loose or whatever. Um, so that would be the way to do it. You can start with just a few. I like that. Like yeah. Like yeah. Up, All you got to do is block off the rest of the thing. So, or I mean, you don't even have to block it off, but stuff will get in there and just stay there. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 So that'll be that'll be that. <coughs> okay, but who who's moving? Like, okay, so we're taking the CNC torch out of there. Who wants to move it? I, I want to let you guys shift it all around. So. Yeah, let's move this over here for now, and we'll figure out how to... Okay. Okay. So what's going in on twenty five? November, October twenty five. Yeah, Monday morning, but we want to wake up. Right. Yeah, we got to make sure we can control the temperature and and motor. So what's the requirement? What are we? What is our definition of done on a on a filament maker? Yeah, like okay, we say we're putting get, getting a week for the filament maker. We're talking about. So the, now the tensioning mechanism, no, but like, pulling like, it and spooling it well, as well. Yeah, uh, we should not assign a week to the filament maker. <laughs> because then it's 95% done as the structure goes. The rest is calibrating how to make it flow efficiently. So to install it, reassemble it so the auger sits on it and then you clean it out. That should be let much less than a day and then have it moving about as good as it was before. And at that point, we just need to make so what's our goal is our goal to get like a spool of filament or just get a sample of filament or what I are we trying to do Well, the question we have to specify the, the goal. Uh, yeah, we can keep 
it running and then you get a bowl of spaghetti but are we actually spooling it up so it's usable because if you just run it you're not gonna be able to use it you gotta have it on a spool you can't just put a wad of this ball of filament on your 3d printer it won't work no, no, you should, uh, making a spool holder and connecting that to a step promoter so it turns in a, in a good way. It's not, unless you support this thing when you change the program or something, it shouldn't be too hard. And it's not, it's not a, it's not a long, it's not a long work session to have it made. It's yeah, so the, what, <laughs> what we've done before was that simple trigger I mentioned in the other meetings where you have the, the filament goes in through this little sensor, if uh, the motor turns on to spool it, once it gets tight, it hits one limit switch because it kind of goes up. If it's got excess, it kind of flows down, so it just flows up and down between two limit switches, which simply activate and deactivate the, mo the controlling motors. Okay. That's, that's the idea. <clears throat> so I, I think that the filament and spooler together are practical to the design case, given the current state of the filament. Good. Okay. Uh, and that's it. The next week after that, you know, if we're continuing the flow of the, the plastic uh, ecosystem, then we're going to spread it along. So, definition of done, we'll be satisfied if we get a spool of filament. What if we uh, don't get it done? Right, so are we doing a window of opportunity approach where it's like, okay, if it doesn't get done, what do we do? Are we extending the timeline or? Uh, my inclination is to say no, because <laughs> we still have other important things we've got to learn. Yeah, I agree, so we just do it. And I think we've got to be able to print with the school of filament. It's not an option. Yeah, yeah, but that, yeah. yeah, but also, yeah, we like 3D printing a Benchy with the PETG pellets and PETG. But they're not PETG, they're ABS. What? Are you serious? The ones that we put in? How do you, How do you know it's ABS? You did a little flame test, burn test? No, I asked you told me it was ABS. Uh, the white stuff? Yeah. Uh, I'm actually not sure what it is. You can test it by... <laughs> <That's only true. laughs> what the I mean, they have but similar melting... Well, no, I mean, they have typically the same, a lot of those plastics are like, you're at about 230 and they all, most of them work at that temperature, like ABS, PLA, PET and stuff, and also polyethylene and stuff. But uh, the thing is, you can burn it, you can see what the smell is. Like, you know, I mean, if you take a known sample of, of ABS and see how it smells. And you can do that relatively easy. Just take a lighter to it, and you'll know immediately by the the kind of uh, test, kind of uh, smell gives the. I mean, we can start. Why don't we start? Well, we don't have. If we had the shredder, we can shred all those misprints. So we, we're doing with PLA now. PLA the advantage is it's a bioplastic. It's not as toxic as the other stuff. Like the PL, the ABS melting, and all those other things have much more fumes. Yeah, it's you got to be in an open air environment for that. So, I mean, ideally we do the testing on on PLA, which is more benign. But we are in an open air workshop, so it's not too bad. Like in the house, like we, we did it in the house last time. Like I have to open all the windows. After a little while, like you start getting lightheaded. It's yeah. it's it's yeah. like nasty. Yeah. You gotta have yeah. fans yeah. and stuff. Um, so, okay, window of opportunity approach. Uh, first week, October 25 to 30, then Shredder. But have we ditched the CNC torque table? Or yeah, well, I mean, this is, we're discussing about this, so so let's let's get this, let's agree the goal of this meeting, I, I mean, let's see if this is, schedule actually holds up, where we got through the first week. What's the second week? So the second week then would be the Shredder, I think the goal would be to be able to make have, uh, shred at the same dimensions as the stuff we were using in the filming. Okay. Sorry, what were you saying? So, if there's on the, the second week, if we focus on the shredder, and I think the goal would be can we throw some uniform, some, some certain type of waste plastic like PET or something like that, and shred it down so we get the same dimensions as the stuff that we're using now in the filming. 
because we want to be able to replace it, right? Ultimately, if we have some. Yeah, we want to make crushed plastic. But we want to make crushed plastic at the same size as the crushed plastic that we know is working. Yeah, size is important. Yeah, it's the current, the, the size is about like quarter inch and less, eighth inch, quarter inch. Uh, that's a question of screen. So uh, you get the screen that comes from McMaster car. We've got some screen here. We don't have enough for like if we do a big, bigger shredder, that's that comes in in a day or two from McMaster car. Uh, that's like but that's it's this cloth. perforated, yeah, yeah, it's harder than hardware cloth. It's more solid than that because hardware cloth might kind of rip. Yeah, as the current um, regrind. Okay, so we're saying we're gonna are we cutting blades manually? Uh, I share that opinion there too, but, but it's would, up to you guys. I would, I would rather go at the CNC torch with uh, a plan B in mind of being able to have it prepared to cut them or order them or... But I'm worried about, I mean, you, you don't seem to be as worried, uh, and, uh, that's reassuring, um, about the measurements of those blades, because in my mind, I'm just thinking, you're saying it won't wobble because of the heat, and I didn't even think of that, but I'm just the way they match next to each other. The way they match next to each other, the, the thing that you have to consider is just that they're flat steel, and that steel is, it's not going to be more than like, like 130, it's like a few, few thousands off, over like, like this much, it's pretty flat. I mean, you won't be able to see any warpage in it. Tips. Oh yeah, well, that's, that's what I'm yeah, as far as the dimensional accuracy, dimensional tolerance of half-inch mild steel, uh, I mean, that is, it's an industrial material, it's no, quite I'm regular. Of, of the hand that cuts with the oh, that, yeah. yeah, but the thing is, you know you're going to be okay this way, they're going to slide past each other because they're made of flat steel, the thing there is, how close are you getting to the actual spacer? You can make that space, you can make a quarter inch, you can cut definitely within a quarter inch by hand. Absolutely, but then you have the, so, then you have the requirement of the, the, the blade adjacent to the, the, the spacer it needs to be uniform around. So if you set it for one tolerance and then you turn the, the, the grinding wheel 180 degrees, you might have a new gap over there. <coughs> it's all, it's all going to be down to how well the middle hole is aligned with the square shaft. Mm -hmm. How you from the diameter of the blades. That that's in my mind. That's what I'm like. Wow, that's going to be pretty. Yeah. Hard. Well, <laughs> the question becomes, what is our maximum tolerance for error here? So the qu that question becomes, okay, that little gap there that you see, what is that gap that we want to make it? Orange. Yeah, but it could be larger. <clears throat> the thing is, the thing that you need is that. The tips of the blades roll past each other, so they're grabbing and they're shredding what goes in between. If you have this this gap there, what that would mean is that you might have some buildup of material, um, but the part that's overlapping there that will always be cutting still. So we can, I mean, here the thing is, because this is like we can just slide these things on, uh, I'm not really concerned about it because if we find that those spacers are like we can oversize it so we've got like an inch of tolerance which would be like not a problem and then the blades are eight inches wide uh, we've got eight inch stock they're eight inches the interior like the tube is like four inches so we can make the spacer is like six inches so you have like two inches of overlap 
Um, I mean, if you look at those dimensions there, uh, understanding the, so from the center, well, let's take a look at from the edge of the shaft to the, to there. So it's, that's six inches there. And just for reality check, <clears throat> no, not six inches, it's three inches. <coughs> Is that space three inches? Six. No. No, it's not. It's two. Two inches plus four inches. That space is, is that much? That's 45. So we can go for 15 more. Does anybody need like a five minute break? No, let's continue. So if that's two inches, the overlap, like if you have those spacers you've got like say one inch there um, that that space there is one inch that you have maximum overlap of uh, right so I mean the, the kind of tolerance we need is like if you overlap like half an inch and you, you can have probably up to like a half inch space it won't grab as much per bite because they're a little because um, the overlap is less like that means the the separation like how much they overlap means like how much they're gonna actually like the size of the chunk that they could bite um, but we still have eight inch blades, so they're going to be able to grab quite a bit of everything. Um, but back to that gap, mm -hmm. you're saying it will be a build up? <laughs> what will happen is that space there, since you got plastic moving on around in there, you'll just have plastic, a layer of plastic that stays in there because there's nothing that's taking it out. Um, well, why wouldn't it fall through the wall? Well, because plastic is kind of plastic, when it kind of like wraps around. What if it's like a long piece? Like over time, it'll probably yeah, build yeah, up. Yeah, they're not necessarily <clears throat> crushed up before they reach that point. Yeah, that's true. I might just like, I'm just saying, but but that won't prevent the shredder from working. No, no, no I get it. It'll, no, I get it no. it'll work. It just have that crud inside of. But actually, that's why they have um, typically in the shredder designs. What they have is these wipers. They have this other set of things that are the wipers on the other side. Uh, so if that gap there, I don't know if you remember from the pictures, but um, the wipers are just protrusions that go from the frame, like in, in there, to scrape off, like if there's plastic getting caught in there. And I mean, it's. Now the other thing is, if that, if we made that, we could make that more like this here like just a spacer that's minimalist spacer it's got like half inch I don't know I would keep it like then you get into issues of how accurately you can cut that by hand but uh, you can do something like this where where this spacer is like six inches diameter there's like a gap of like half inch and you're overlapping the blades half inch like that, that would still be quite a good, looks like a pretty good functioning thing. Um, how much overlap, like if you look at uh, images of Shredder? Um, you get a, like, a lot of insight from. There's a possibility of doing some by hand, and then we can say, oh, okay, we're actually going to get the torch table up and running. But to me, it's more like we should probably be doing it the other way around. Um, here in this design, it's like there's not too much overlap of the teeth. It's just like minimal. That, I mean, you're going to be shredding stuff, I mean, no matter what. <clears throat> I don't think that the issue of tolerance is... The, sh the showstopper here 
because even if you have very little tolerant very little overlap here that means you definitely make sure that you're not hitting blades you'll still be fine simply because we got so much overpowering on the actual motors and things like that um, yeah I mean the overlap I mean it's not too big <clears throat> here it looks more like yeah kind of kind of what we we're discussing okay so then so then the big thing that I guess is uh, if we throw the CNC switch back into our second beat uh, with the shredder Parallel passing would be really important. Like we have to start the week working on the improvements to the shredder and doing the every or the, the improvements to the CNC switch and doing everything possible that can be done in parallel with the shredder prior to the blades. <laughs> right? And then like by Wednesday, you need to have some conversions. Otherwise, by Wednesday, we'd have to just keep making the blades by hand. And the only issue I see with that is dividing our workforce. So if we start off that week and we say we're going to do the CNC switch and we're going to do the shredder, then there's got to be some additional labor. Like there are some things with the shredder that can get started by all of the motor shaft connections, putting the tube on the, on the shaft and whatnot. Right? All of that's just got to get done regardless while the CNC switch is being prepared. And then by midweek, we need to make a determination about whether or not we can actually use the torch to make the blades, or if we have to do the blades by hand. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's not good. Yeah, I would perhaps start out with the CNC torch, but I think that's, that's good. We could probably finish up the film and make it a bit of a anticipated schedule, maybe? Yeah, then we can get ahead of it. So the, the only thing too is full transparency. You know, March Madness makes you my schedule well in advance. And so next week is the week I got to go to Arizona on Thursday. So I'm only going to be here next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then I'll be back on Monday. I have a trip. I'll be back. So, how much would you like to do? No, I, I just, uh, I'm flying out of Kansas. Ah, oh, sweet. Okay. Keep going for week three. Yeah, so then week three, I think, uh, to, to put the ecosystem together, our, our outcome would be that we want to print something using the plastic that we shredded. So we have to develop the high speed chamber for the pro. Yeah, that's a contingency. Yeah, and then uh, figure out all the software configurations for doing a higher temperature print. Anything that needs to be changed in the software and firmware to enable us to produce a user and then print something. Sounds easy, right? Yeah. Um, so, high T chamber, focus. Yeah. Do we have, I mean, to be able to go on that effectively, shouldn't be too hard. We just have to have a rough idea about materials to which use. You can just have paddles with the rock wool or whatever it is. Yeah, small metal plates, uh, like yeah, eighth inch steel. Yeah, so this is much and smaller. And the rock wool inside. Yeah, that's good enough. Some yeah, kind of like what was drawn up already, which is. Um, this kind of stuff, just the simple thing. So, like angles on the corners. This was actually. Um, well, this is actually showing fire brick. Uh, it's another way, but uh, you got to seal up all the gaps between the bricks. So you, you pretty much need the like flat sheet sheets of steel. Anyway, um, where did that go? So here was like more of the larger design, where it's like angles, flat sheets. Now on a pro. We have one axis, so we only have to have one slit. We might want to reconfigure the axis so it's the axis is laying for the bed, the bed mount, 
is vertical like this so you only have one narrow slit that you have to close up as opposed to the two two rods that hold the bed so you could do something like that so pretty much like remount the bed so so the bed holder axis is like this and that's cutting that's the part you have to insulate when you have that slit going up the heated chamber yeah Well, uh, underneath it's all closed. It's the bottom. So you go and you basically moving the bed up and down like this. So like at the bottom, like it's not going all the way to the bottom. So the slit needs to start only like a little bit above. It doesn't necessarily go all the way to the top because the bed is raised a little bit. So it's effectively a box with a slit with enough motion so the bed could go up and down <coughs> to reach the <coughs> the print height. Use a bigger frame. A frame, bigger frame was probably uh, needed unless <laughs> you're happy with a smaller heated area. So the idea there was, which we discussed at other times, was that if you're making a heated area, like this was in a large 3D printer dock, uh, the consideration is that the area of printing. The frame has to be much bigger than that because you have to move the shroud, move the shield around. And that was the discussion here. We talked about this, and that was for the bigger one. But basically, the the heat shield there we had 12 by 24 inch, which meant that, yeah, uh, effectively like you need like two or three times the size but you can also take the same printer if you make say the red is the heated enclosure if you make the shroud only like go over a little bit like up to the edges of the frame yeah you can print but that means you can only print so much before you, your your heat shield hits hits the edge so you might have a smaller area but still to get anything that's printing at very high temperature is a proof of concept because that means oh now i just got to increase my frame and other things so we can leave everything the same uh, not not build other frames and just have a smaller print area that's all so so that would lead to the question well what's what do we want to do what's our definition of done is that are we happy with just a small proof of concept that we can print at very high temperature because actually once we get once we have this shroud it's not like whether we can get like 80 degrees or 180 degrees once we enclose it we're, we're that's it uh, it's limited by the temperature of the of the actual shroud itself, which on the sides it's very high temperature. On the top, if you use say polycarbonate, that's 120 C, which is really good. If we use PEI, that's 180 C, which is all that we need ever. So uh, once we do it, the, the proof of concept even on a small thing is a is a major accomplishment because nobody in the world is doing this right now in the open source the closest was the most the michigan tech people joshua pierce but it wasn't a true high temperature thing they had high temper they had temperature sensitive components inside still so i think this is awesome and then from there it gives us as collaborators like the ongoing opportunity to find the buyers for you know how to, how to rework it to make it more useful Okay, so we're satisfied with a very small print area, proof of concept of very high temperature. Is that? Yeah, I think it's a much more. I think that's one corner to cut to make sure we make, do as much as possible for the next. So, yeah. <coughs> okay, so does the thing, the statement before, using the material that we shredded and turned <coughs> turned into filament, is that still the requirement? I mean, the reason we're doing all these things is that we want to create that whole tool chain of, of making the temperature. <coughs> so yeah, that should definitely be the... Yeah, but that means if that is not done, that we're spending time on doing that. That's the definition of done. If, if, oh, if yeah, we yeah, define right. that as the definition yeah. of done, then we cannot move past that until we do it. Yeah, you're right, you're right. So, so I think we need to take that out because we should move on that regardless of where we are with the shredder, like whatever happened in shredder and torch, 
we can still do that as a very significant achievement. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, just buy high temperature filaments such as a great one would be polycarbonate. You know, getting great prints with polycarbonate. Do we do we have rolls of that? We no, we don't. It's just Amazon. So, so I say so, we get a roll yeah. of, of high temperature material. Yeah. But yeah. being able to attend the high tea chamber is dependent on the fact that we get the shredder and we make her move it. Uh, so it's this scenario is sort of a contingent upon a contingent. But it would be great to have a backup set of filament to try the machine out unless we don't have it. But if we don't have filament, do we want to make a high temperature chamber? Uh, yeah, we still do because yeah. that's a mi significant yeah. milestone. Then I said we do it. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I Small high T print using, we can say, polycarbonate or some other. I mean, we can even go nuts and say PEI or PEAK. That's like, those that's are serious hard. industrial printing materials that very few people are doing. So what's going to be Yeah, for that you only need like probably like 120 polyprop polyethylene. Oh yeah, actually to show that we're printing with polyethylene, yeah, that would be because that's like all your trash bags and containers and all that. Polycarbonate and polyethylene. Yeah. Uh, if not, we have the polycarbonate, we can still put it back. Yep. Alright, so then the only other things that I think uh, I would like to sort of add into the discussion is on the filament maker schooler side of things, that is an opportunity for us to dive deeper into the universal controller and actually doing sort of controller design, right? Because it's a really, really simple controls. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, we've been talking about repurposing the universal controller and some of the limitations associated with it, or the idea of having a right new front layer for all of the different controls and stuff like that. There's a super simple opportunity for us to have a lot of things there. This quick thing can do something like that. So, for next week, I'd like to see, you know, maybe we could work that in on the simple projects. Wait, hold on a second. Is that, are you out the first week? Or that's um, it. Just Thursday and Friday. I'm here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So. Or, I mean, we get started this weekend. Or, I can start. And I can obligate everybody else to start. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah. What I'm really saying is this is the project focus look at the next six weeks. Uh, and then there are, there are like the, the underlying educational goals that I, I still want to make sure are met in the execution of all of these different things. Like if we make a filament maker in the school where I don't really learn anything to do about controls. And, you know, if we make a shredder, that's cool. I think the hydraulics <laughs> is really simple on the shredders, especially if we're just going to power it from the existing track. You know, it's, there's nothing that I yeah, really anticipate learning about hydraulics as a design and building the structure at this point, right? But the uh, uh, the CEB press, you know, I want to learn about power cubes and I want to learn about hydraulic design, right? So that's really the draw for the CEB press. And for me, it's less about making bricks. It's more about understanding power cube and hydraulic system design, right? So I guess those are the big things that, that I still want to make sure are you know, because we're looking at this again from a project point of view, and one of my, my comments yesterday was that to me, it's less about building prototypes and more about building capacity. So I want to make sure that I'm hitting certain educational goals in you and all of these things. Right? Okay. So, so um, third week of November, so fourth week. Um, well, third week. So 15 through 19. So CB press? Is what we're saying? Oh yeah, I would like to very much to do that. But 
with the shredder, there is an addition of needing a power cube, or, or, or if we have a shredder, can we hook it up and run it without the, a day spent on the... Uh, we got a sh shredder. If we want to run the shredder, we just connect it to micro track or live track. And then readily. you the motor. Or one of those yeah. Uh, motors. Yeah, yeah th those are an essential part of the shredder, yeah. Yeah, but uh, we don't need to do much else than just hook that up. No, and just. Track. You get a valve, you go uh, a two spool valve, because we got two motors. So you connect hydraulics from one to one motor. And the other spool, we connect it to the other motor. It's two hoses, but it's actually three hoses. There's the return, there's a small hose, which is called the case drain, which is like the lubricating bypass fluid. So you actually have three hoses, but none of that is okay. any challenging. Yeah, so that's what I was saying. Like so, yeah, in the CV press, however, right? Yeah. I love the idea of doing the CEB press and getting to know the hydraulic system through that. Yeah. Mm. So I'd, I'd say that's a good question. Uh, there's only one uh, one issue I have with that. So we got five days. Now, um, did you guys take a look at the comments on the number of people versus how much we can do? Would that make any sense? Yeah, I think that it definitely rules out the large tractor, you know, so I guess that's not, my question is, what is practical in terms of the CBD? Well, that's, so I was going to say, so the, the practical figures are 12 people for one day. Okay. Now, what does one day mean? <laughs> uh, when, when I say one day, I mean a long day into the night, um, means like 8 a.m., and then some people are still around there at like 11 p.m. and stuff, finishing up. So in practice, it means two days for a normal person. Um, so think of it as 12 people over two days. Now, how many people do we have that are going to be working on it? I can get more. I can actually get at least two more people. I don't know if the number of the dean, one of the guys who came out with me, uh, he's willing to come back out. Oh, okay. We should probably communicate with Richard at the least that there's a schedule change. So if he does want to yes, so after, after today, we, once we get this thing nailed here. Yeah. Um, a, so we could potentially have three more people with us for the CD press and maybe this one. Uh, so, okay. So three people plus us. So that brings us to how many? Seven. Seven? Okay, so if that's the case, then um, five to eight people. Um, well, so how many days do we have for that? For so right now we're saying five days on that. Um, if you count. So it's two days with 12, so think about 24 man days. So we've got eight. Oh, that would be three. That's if you've got eight. <clears throat> three days. So I'm thinking maybe the first, you know, the morning of the first day, we'll do an overall, hey, this is a CD press, these are all the subsystems that make it work. You know, there's the mechanical, there's the, the structure, there's the hydraulic system, there's the controls, bam. Everybody kind of gets the, the stage set. And then I'm guessing the first day and a half are really going to be welding mostly, just actually taking the cut metal pieces, putting it all together. And then you have power cube, the hydraulic system has to get implemented. And then I don't know if we plan to do any automation with the university of the but I mean, that, that looks like four days, five days right there. So. Yeah, I mean, we don't have a... <clears throat> so, so the other assumption here is for the the twelve person thing, we have to work off a clear existing design. So it's more like the extreme manufacturing style where we're we're going. We've got plans. We're not changing anything. Everything goes according to plan. But we have the the other controller, which is not universal controller based. It's a, still an Arduino with with a selector switch for the brick thickness and 
solenoid controls and pressure sensor and stuff like that. Um, so we build that. We can't. We don't. We don't have enough time to innovate on what's what the adaptation of the control, the universal controller will be. Largely, be like functionality things like packaging and there's a bunch of detail that goes into that. But yeah, we could do the what we have already. Replicate what what we know. Um, so for five days, I mean, it's it's going to be um, five days to. Yeah, I mean, sounds sounds doable. <clears throat> but we would have to have more people, though, with us here. I mean, um... <clears throat> so let me know what price I'm going to tell the people if they're going to come for five days. With the, knowing that, you know, food isn't going to be included and all of that, right? <laughs> just, just let me know what that price would be for those five days and I can tell other people. You know. What about, I think, Paul expressed interest in the CEB press. Um, Paul uh, Paul one. Yeah, yeah. Is uh, Prince coming back? Uh, I doubt it. Is Has anyone still heard still from here? Prince or anything? Or? We haven't heard anything, but it's Prince is still here. Same goes for Joshua. Joshua, Joshua. <laughs> Joshua's gonna come back. He's gonna save us. No. No, he ha haven't heard it heard anything. Um Okay, yeah, it's doable, but it's not going to be easy. It's a, it's a thousand six hundred pound machine. It's a big one. So uh, yeah, that, it's a, it's one of those things that it, it is hard work. It's heavy heavy machine pieces. You need to use use the hoist to move it around and stuff like that. Uh, there's it's more difficult than I would say say the 3d printer frame because now you have to be precise you cannot there's like no adjustment for oh if you don't get it square you can do an auto parallel mechanism no it doesn't work that way here here everything's got to be square so um that's that's the challenge it it does require a little little more skill than i would say like the 3d printer frame where we weld it up because we've got the pieces cut as long as they meet up we're fine um here you have to pay more attention it's a place where a person like like Ben is useful because Ben, for example, can square things up effectively and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so yeah. How much uh, with the CB press? How much is like? How much time will be spent on cutting pieces, uh, sourcing them? Like, uh, what state is that project? Yeah. So all the CNC cut pieces are in stock right now I did not inventory the order in terms of oh verify that every single piece is here we, we can do that and that would be a good thing to do like uh, soon that compare compared to all the plans that we have <clears throat> everything is there otherwise if you're if we don't have some pieces we can probably you know just cut out some and, and okay, do stuff good. like that so oh, there's that a backup yeah, we've got CNC cut, and that's what enables it to be pretty fast. Uh, there's a few pieces. The alignment part is the part that's, uh, I would say, the challenging. There's definitely the hydraulics where we pretty much got to weld up this. So you've got this big cylinder, you've got this press foot that has to be very much square right on top, fitting that in the main chamber. The drawer slides in and out. It's actually got some 3D printed pieces. We need to do a few 3D printed pieces because it slides on one inch rods just like the big printer, the, the drawer slides on one inch rods back and forth. Um, Is that a carriage for those of you? Yeah, uh, so basically like four carriages for four four bearings. Still the one inch bearings that we've been using, same thing actually. So, But yeah, um, the hydraulics, uh, we've got the valves. Uh, we'd have to order the just the electronic controller parts which are which the full BOM does exist. So we, we've got <laughs> if you want to start taking a look at, I mean, what would really help if somebody take took a look at the controller document um, and actually prepare that, like be on top of that, because I can only be in so many places. <clears throat> uh, but I think the controller is. So, 
this is the controller so we're using we're basically going with CB press 1708 which is our release and the controller we did an upgrade of the controller since then 1901 so the, the check mark here that's relevant and the controller 1901 there's a full instruction that's what it is it's an Arduino selector switch a pressure switch on the machine uh, that's the very first original one but you got solenoids that you gotta wire up uh, the full documentation is here for how this entire system works including notes on yeah it's all it's all here you gotta study this doc it goes from That's what I like having weekends <clears throat> understanding <laughs> what the pressing sequence is goes into a simple overview of the system uh, there's how the block the solenoid valves mount on the blocks here's the pressure sensor selector uh, here's like wiring so we're using this relay to drive the solids this relay hat it's a it's a shield for the Arduino uh, we're using a mega Arduino mega you got plugs in for uh, so there's plugs like these automotive plugs they're ex exterior rated so it's, this thing is outside we have these plugs hanging out of the controller box up down left right you gotta put this flyback diode across the solenoids for sparks not happening um, the controller box it's like it's weatherproof here's more about like how things are wired up um, that, that's like future work just have it use the universal controller where you have on a screen select your brick thickness and stuff it's actually much more convenient than this because here you got a wire you got this fat switch it's got all these wire connections and all that you eliminate all of that with um, just this simple selector switch and screen because you just turn and, and that's already there you don't have to do any extra wiring for that um, yeah but yeah study this that's pretty much says everything about it <clears throat> yep so that's cool maybe, maybe <clears throat> something like before each week like because I know over the weekend it would be the weekend before we begin you know, we'll, I'd love to start diving into the documentation so you know just even like quick email here are the places in the wiki that are most relevant so we're going to start next week you know and even that like Friday or uh, yeah. I think anything that would make uh, that is in that line of thinking of anticipating what we need to do given now that we have Saturdays and Sundays off when we could maybe charge our batteries and do even more folks to, to, to work that like before a Monday session maybe we have a, an update of where we're at I mean, it could be done within the team too, but any support in that direction where maybe you took a trip through the workshop and you saw that, well, this thing is going to be sweet, I'm sure that's okay to go for the next step. And then I think it's a bit abstract for me, but. Maybe we all do that for something like that. Yeah, I mean, sure, but I, I, and we should, we absolutely should. We should be at some point as possible to be able to work quickly. But for all the things we can't anticipate, since we haven't built the machine before. Uh, so what's that translate to on a on a calendar here? Well, Are we I saying like in review? In a sense, try to support, have some sort of project management support towards us that we have a, a decent overview for every work session, and that could be more expensive for Mondays because then we we'll have two days to. to so Monday, I mean, there's the mornings like we can talk and go through stuff. In the morning sessions, are you saying? I say before the morning, se um, morning session on Monday, and it would be great to have uh, a list you could present where you would like, uh, I went through the workshop, here's where we're at with this machine, these are the three things we need to do today. And then we bring those topics into the meeting, let the meeting be about those specifically, have it be 45 minutes, and then we'll go through the workshop. Something like that. Okay. Um, Yes, 
even better, yeah. I mean, the ideal thing from my perspective is like there's data collection, there's a development spreadsheet, there's data collection, yeah. like take pictures and log log things like um, the basic protocols around here are start your work log, like a manual log, marching log or whoever, um, put all the links like if, what, like pictures, I mean data collection is mostly like okay take pictures and write things down. Yeah, yeah, okay. in whatever way possible so then it becomes easy like we've got the blueprints of what we're what we're trying to work on but in a development template you start with your requirements your concept design and we want to fork that for every project because we're going to change different things every time we we do it that's why that's the comment like every build is effectively a fork because not everything is going to be the same ever um, but that's where what i would suggest on that is use the development template and between the working doc, data collection, like it would be easy for me to review it if, if, if I first know like, okay, what did you try to do here? So where does that go? Well, that's conceptual design or maybe requirements. So if you can keep track of all of that, it makes it easy for, to actually build upon it. Here we're, we're doing some planning on what some of our goals are, but then once we start implementing it, we do want to keep a paper trail, the easiest thing there being the working docs that we typically do. Uh, which would be like in the development template that would be conceptual design uh, so if we can so what do we do I have a recommendation for like right now and then also for future workshops and so my recommendation for right now would be tomorrow's morning meeting can we use that to go over the development template data collection and logs because to me it's a little nebulous and I think if we just sit down for an hour and say as a contributor at OSC, you know, this is how you start the log, this is how we usually organize data, report a project, this is how we begin the development template. If we just kind of go through that, I think that would be really useful. And then I would feel empowered to go out there, take pictures, video, all that stuff, and know how to put it on the wiki correctly. So I think we can do that probably in an hour and make that the focus of tomorrow's meeting. And then maybe in the future for workshops, that might be something to lead with so that every contributor sort of knows how to do that in a way that's organized and so things don't get too chaotic. Because a lot of people were taking video, a lot of people were taking pictures in the workshop. And I don't I don't know that all of that media is going to wind up on wiki in a way that's useful. Right? No, of course not. <laughs> because it takes discipline to actually do it. It takes time and discipline and knowledge. There's a boatload of info on this. If you want to get a head start on tomorrow's discussion, look at a page on the wiki, because I've done this presentation a number of times already. Okay. It's called Collaborative Literacy. <clears throat> There's a few videos there. 2021, 20, 2019. Uh, there's, a, there's a webinar. There's, there's this session from New Zealand, which was decent. Uh, 2019 discussion with Eugene Kim. I think Eugene Kim actually coined the frame collaborative literacy. So, um, and then kind of independently, like I didn't know that, I, I started using the word and I found that I was Googling it and found him behind it. So I talked to him. There's a decent discussion there. Um, this collaborative literacy, that was like, what, I think 2018. There's principles and procedures collaboration protocol but it's like idea is that <clears throat> in a in a more philosophical sense or more abstract viewpoint is that the critical understanding of it goes back down to general semantics and time binding if you guys know what those words mean but nobody does because we don't learn about this but but um, time binding is of course our unique capacity to learn upon you know, build upon prior knowledge, and that completely applies to if you do open source and information is open, then the amount of stuff you can do and how you can facilitate and accelerate the kind of learning now with the coming of the internet age is just exploded. But I don't feel like anybody's really using that power, you know, not at all. It's like, um, but the idea there is that if you understand it, you can say that, wait, wait a minute, we can actually all collaboratively develop products and rework the entire economy like 
bam, in a second, if people, if many, many more people understood the idea that it's even possible. But it is. At here, we're showing that, oh yeah, well, you could actually then build crazy things that formerly industrial systems were needed for. Um, this digital fabrication, all this new capacity. But at the end of the day, that's no good until you actually start kind of like with a discussion we had on our walk yesterday it's like what are people actually doing for a living because we can create new systems based on now our ability to pretty much learn and leapfrog over all of this human knowledge in rapid times which is just an amazing opportunity but it does have to go down to you're actually getting engaged in it and this is actually the new economy. It has to go to that economic end where this is our new economy, our new life, way of living. Uh, and economics in the broad sense, like economics comes from the word housekeeping. That's how we keep house collaboratively across the whole world and nobody's left out. Um, I used the, also added the term economic time binding, which is that, that capacity to learn and build upon rapidly in the economic sense that you can develop new products to the point where the inevitable end is distributed market substitution meaning that every single product out there it's it just becomes there becomes the optimal uh open source collaboratively developed version which has got all that competitive waste taken out of it it's bigger better faster stronger and it leads to the substance of a new really a new economic paradigm um so that's that's the thing behind collaborative literacy and, and then it comes down to okay that's cool theory but how do you actually implement it and there's tools and techniques with, which we can there's all those tools are here and there's many choices we can take but it's like it's got to be open source collaborative scalable high performance and all that all the kind of stuff that's embodied in OSC specifications if you read through that so there's a bunch of this um, underlying knowledge or assumptions that like when, when I speak and I present about this, it's, I'm trying to throw it in there. But there's a lot of stuff in there. There's a, a lot of stuff from the OSC spec, the collaborative literacy part. And I do still say that the collaborative literacy part is the part that's missing. Um, there's not, not like any technological or um, no technological barriers or first principle barriers to why we cannot thrive as a civilization. That's a pretty deep topic. And uh, we can all contribute to that. And I wish... Uh, more people could would learn about it. So my goal is, is, is to try to teach that better. Um, and it's, yeah, there's a lot to it. But start with that, and, and we can talk about just the basics of how we do things around here. Um, yeah. Um... um yeah um, now for today what are we doing so a couple of housekeeping things so uh, did anyone see what happened to my camera someone looks like they dropped and the lens busted what happened there uh, I, yesterday I went in the shop to pick up the cameras. I noticed one, I mean, looks like somebody knocked it over something. The lens is not working anymore. It's the nice it's telephoto. Me. Was you? Uh, yeah, I was moving the uh, cables and it did fall over. I didn't think there was anything. Uh, the lens did come off. I put it back on. I didn't think there was... Uh, okay, yeah. No, it's, it's busted. We need another one. Okay. Um, Can you even buy another camera? Uh, camera's good. It's that's good because that's a nice, expensive camera. Or Canon SL3 uh, just need the lens. It's the 75 to 300 millimeter telephoto. Thing. 75 to it's 75 to 300 telephoto. That one. It's not, it's not the standard one you get with the. No, the it's oh, yeah. telephoto. It's do it from the far distance. Got no, that nice know. depth of field thing. What's the cost on that? It's like 200 bucks. Well, um, what do you think about streaming the workshop live to the internet always? That would be good. I'd like it. <clears throat> How do you do it? 
<laughs> well, it's actually, you know, you can also think about it as a security feature. We're under the open source panopticon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, how do we do it? I mean, if, if you, I mean, I'd recommend like uh, the OpenCV camera I mentioned on my work mod because you can just plug it into Ethernet and then you can always be streaming like a 4K video to YouTube or something. And it's basically the this it's the same cost as the lens. It's like 200 bucks. Um, there are different versions. It depends if you want um, basically depth sensing in the workshop. You're talking about the OPD? Yeah. It's not gonna be released until April. No, 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 no. So there's one that's cheaper, but. Uh, yeah, I think as far as like. Well, we want the time lapse thing, like, cause it, I mean, I'm doing all of that because uh, we're actually getting good data out of it and seeing how long things take, like how the workflow actually goes. It's actually really good stuff to study. It looks like just like a time lapse, but you can get a lot of info out of that if you study it. This, this, I don't know <clears> if you looked at this, but haven't haven't seen it. Um, so I think, I mean, um, yeah, if you're if you're instead of getting a lens, I would. If you're going to pay, like, this is 300 so it's a little bit more, but it's 4K, it can run computer vision, can stream the internet through the Ethernet 24-7, it's pretty durable. Does it have any apps for doing any CV yeah, it stuff? Computer, it's the OpenCV, the guys who wrote OpenCV nice, that yeah. are involved with this camera. Hmm. I, would, I would love to set it up and experiment with it. If you decide to go with that over the lens. Well, I mean, we still need the lens because that's more like for communications and it's part of the data collection stuff. So, no, I would still, that would be something like more on top of that if, if we wanted to go more. Um, yeah. Is the is the hardware design open source or no? So the, hard, the hardware is open. Um, Luxon is the company that uses it. They pay for some pretty expensive software. So it's kind of like the situation where, uh, and I've seen this a lot, where the hardware is open source, but the design tools to make the hardware are not like open source. So, but you know, mm -hmm. at least there's like specs that are like PDFs and stuff. So theoretically, it's all pretty open. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, chips aren't open, but uh, yeah, hardware. So like when you say open hardware, it, basically the firmware is not open source or? It's, I think it's full. No, firm, firmware is. But I guess, so what's the design part that's not open? If they use like a design tool, you know, for example, like uh, tools besides like other CAD tools or like other electronics design tools other than like CAD, stuff, stuff like that. Is for the actual like, circuits? Yeah. Okay. So I'm not yeah. sure like what the <clears throat> level of uh, like, I guess like purity of products we need to use should be, like whether it, like if an uh, open source thing is designed with, you know, like a different CAD software than FreeCAD, you can import it in yeah. FreeCAD as STLs or something. Sounds but pretty good. Like, do you think that's enough, or do you think we should? Uh, as long as there's an open format file like STEP or whatever, you yeah, know, that's pretty good. And you can work with it yeah. and modify it. Yeah, we'll take a look at that. Um, all right, so for today, what what are we doing? So, I mean, uh, one thing, it's like we should like clean up the shop. The stuff is all over the place. Like, put everything back and do a little cl house cleaning in the shop. Uh, if we're... F yeah. So, what's the plan for today? What are we doing? That sounds good. Helmet maker. So are we starting on a filament maker spooler parts uh, first thing then? The, so do a little house cleaning and then yeah, house cleaning continue? Be, I, I did some cleaning in the workshop, but it's completely beyond a little workspace. What about like spending like a day like reorganizing the workshop? I see we spend an hour uh, on it. Sure, sure. 
because like I see maker spaces that are like really really organized and I guess because there's so many machines in the workshop it feels like it's just gotten out of hand the amount of stuff yeah, uh, what we can do is put everything back to where it was before and then we have uh, these Yeah, I mean, access, I mean, there's space and there's knowing where tools and supplies are. Like, we can organize all the tools, that's the main thing we work with. Supplies and supplies, they're kind of general, they're general the areas. We, we put things in their place, yeah. um, we'll do ourselves a big favor. Mm -hmm. It's probably a shift start, and then we diagnose what the next steps for the filament maker is. Mm -hmm. um, I have done some measurements on the CNC torch, so we find a little time to talk about that uh, just preemptively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's do it.